We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bearing witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for him. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his final messenger. We ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon him, the prophets and messengers that came before him, his family and companions that served alongside him, and those that follow in his blessed path until the day of judgment. And we ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, in the midst of the destruction of what is taking place in Gaza, there was a question that someone had asked me that I found very interesting. So this was a brother that wasn't familiar with the Arabic language and he was watching one of the rescue workers go through and pick people up and move bodies around and settle families and deliver food. And as he was watching this video, there was a subtitle that said, his heart is like a stone. And so he actually stopped me and he said, what does it mean his heart is like a stone? Because that sounds like something inherently negative. And obviously there is a method, there's a saying that you will hear in some Arab cultures that say, Qalbu zayl hajar. his heart is like a stone or like a rock, but it means something entirely different from what we're actually accustomed to it meaning and the Quranic implication of it. When that saying is said, it's referring to a person who is able to bear so much pain in the moment, who is able to settle themselves in the moment and take care of people and almost suppress their own emotions as they're dealing with other people. And so it's actually said in a praiseworthy way. Qalbu zayl hajar, they'll say this. He has a heart like stone. He can go through there. He can you know, carry the wounded. He can take this, he can take that, and look at him, he's not even crying, look at him, he's not screaming, everyone else around him is screaming, he's in the zone, right? Qalbu zayl hajar. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, the difference between that and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam yatni lilladheena amanu an takhsha'a kulubuhum li dhikrillahi wa ma nazala min al haq. Isn't it time for those who believe to humble their hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the remembrance that He has revealed of truth? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and don't be like those who came before you from the people of the book whose hearts became hard. They became like rock. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah that some people's hearts become hard like rocks. Some people's hearts become even harder than stone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns that type of a heart. A heart that can't receive anything good anymore. A heart that doesn't have any type of beating of khayr, any type of beating of good, it's just dead. And subhanAllah, the implications of those two things could not be more different. And I realize that there's a difference between a hard heart and a tired heart. There's a difference between a heart that has shut itself off from revelation and the implications of revelation and in the process became hard and a heart that had to bear the consequences of having to sustain so many people. It's like if you have multiple oxygen machines plugged into one, and so that heart has to be at a certain level and has to give of its own oxygen, but there's a difference between the two. And is there any shari basis for this? Is there anything within the Quran and the Sunnah that speak to this? And why is it so important right now? As we come into the month of Ramadan and the genocide in Gaza continues, there are two sentiments that many of us have heard or felt. I feel empty. I'm tired. I don't feel the, the, the ibadah. I don't feel the worship like I used to. Or, you know, I'm seeing these images and it's an overload of these images now. I'm not crying anymore or my tears are drying up. How do I, how do I cry or how do I still feel something? Because I don't want to get used to this, right? Or, of course, I put it away because it's becoming too much for me. So how do I deal with all of this? And subhanAllah, it just so happens that we are in the 12th juz, or we have come through the surah of Yusuf alayhi salam. And we've been reflecting on Yusuf alayhi salam in multiple ways and the story of Ya'qub alayhi salam in multiple ways. And I want you to think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ya'qub alayhi salam. 
It's, you know, from, from a pure Arabic language perspective, just analyzing this from a language perspective, from a linguistic perspective, subhanAllah, seemingly two completely contradicting emotions in one. He cried his eyes out to a point of blindness. He went blind from crying. Al-Muqatir rahimahullah says he was blind for six years because of the amount of crying, because of the amount of grief over Yusuf alayhi salam. And the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam thought that by throwing him away, they would diminish the favoritism. They diminished the attachment of Yaqub to Yusuf alayhi salam. But what ended up happening is that Yaqub loved him even more. That Yaqub's attachment to him remained and it only grew in terms of love. And so those that tried to throw away Yusuf ended up creating an even greater attachment and longing and empathy for Yusuf. It sounds very much so, by the way, like our oppressors that think that the more that they kill, the more that the world will get used to the killing and the less people will sympathize and people will just simply accept this as a matter of life. May Allah allow us to prove them wrong. May Allah allow us to prove them wrong because that's what they're counting on, right? So the brothers of Yusuf thought, we throw him away, eventually he gets over it. Eventually he gets over it. He cried so much that he went blind for six years. Think about the time frame of six years. But Allah subhanahu wa says, while he was swallowing it. It's like, wait, what? You know, Allah Azza wa says, وَالْكَالْ وِمِينَ الْغَيْثِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Those who swallow their anger. And he uses the same word for Ya'qub alayhi salam. فَهُوَ كَالِيم He swallowed it. What does that mean? Qatada rahimahullah says, what that means is, لَا يَقُولُ إِلَّا خَيْرًا he used to cry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would take his grief to Allah. So when he says, Inama ashku bathi wa huzni Allah, that I complain of my sadness and grief to Allah, that's not posturing. That's not him saying to his sons, like, you know, sometimes you say, I only do this for the sake of Allah. And the fact of you saying, I only do this for the sake of Allah, is an indication that maybe you're not doing it for the sake of Allah. Right? Or I only cry for the sake of Allah could actually be a statement because the munafiqun used to make grand statements, right? It doesn't mean everyone who makes a statement is a munafiq. That means that the hypocrites in their nature would make grand statements, but have a lot of emptiness behind those statements. A lot of, a lot of platitudes, a lot of posturing. When Yaqub says this to his kids, he's not posturing that I complain of my grief to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I take my tears and my grief to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's literally a lifestyle that he has. It is a lifestyle that he bears it and then he takes it to a certain part. And the intensity of those emotions is felt in his dua and then felt in his not giving up hope in Yusuf salam. but it's not to a point. I mean, you would think that a man who cries over Yusuf salam that much would not be able to live with the brothers of Yusuf salam. Somehow, somehow Yaqub salam still functions. Somehow, he's still in the same household with those that caused him this pain for all of these years. SubhanAllah, what's going on here? And how do we reckon with the intensity of the emotion on one hand and the seemingly diminished emotion on the other hand? And here we are, SubhanAllah, and we face these two realities. The dual reality of Ramadan going on, acts of worship being intensified, but perhaps the emptiness of emotion and seeing so much tragedy that at some point, just like if a part of your body gets stabbed or a part of your body gets blunted over and over again, there's a protection mechanism to where it numbs itself, we feel numbness. And I don't know how to reckon with that numbness. Should I feel guilty? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to punish me because the tears dry out? Am I going to be asked about this? And this is what I want to come to bi-idhnillahi ta'ala in these few moments, inshaAllah ta'ala, of this khutbah. And I hope you think about it bi-idhnillahi ta'ala and inject your worship with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to inject your worship with and inject what you are doing for your brothers and sisters with something special. When Allah Azza wa Jal talks about revelation in the Qur'an and when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi talks about revelation in the Qur'an, there is not a condemnation of those who don't feel the intensity of emotion with the revelation. Rather, there is praise for those that do have an intensity of emotion. So the intensity of emotion 
with the revelation coming down is something that's praiseworthy. If it leads you in khushur, if it leads you into humility, and it leads you kharru sujjadan wa bukiya, if it leads you to, to prostration and crying, there's praise of that. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises, or when Allah azza wa ta'ala condemns the other side of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not condemning the lack of emotion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is condemning the lack of action on it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns people that turn away from the revelation. The Prophet وسلم, condemns people that turn away from the revelation. And essentially what you start to see is that the Prophet وسلم, hones in on this idea that you lose the revelation when you fail to recite it and act upon it. If you're not reciting the Qur'an frequently, you will lose it. If you're not acting upon the Qur'an frequently, you will lose it. And that loss is not simply a loss of memory. Your camels will go loose and the Qur'an will leave from you and actually become a testimony against you on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So the way that you maintain the revelation of the Qur'an is by reciting it and by acting upon it. What about when it comes to empathy? How do I maintain empathy? And what is empathy when it comes to our brothers and sisters and what is happening right now? A lot of times, dear brothers and sisters, we mistake apathy for fatigue. They're not the same thing. It's one thing to intentionally not care and to not care that you don't care. Like, I, I want to move away from this all and I, I actually, you know, I need to protect myself so I'm not going to expose myself to what's happening in the world. It's another thing to care and to be tired, but then to try to find ways to make sure that what drove your empathy in the first place continues to drive you to action. If the way to maintain revelation is through recitation and through acting upon it, the way to maintain empathy is through acting upon it as well. Meaning what? On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to raise you and say to you, you didn't shed enough tears for Gaza or you didn't cry enough, but he will take you to account for not speaking enough, for not doing enough, for not praying enough, for not moving enough. Because that's what the point of that empathy is. It's not the intensity of the emotion. It's the imperative of the action, the deed that follows. That's how you guard it. The intensity of emotion is good, especially if you can find a way to channel it the way that Yaqub did. And that's the perfection of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the perfection of the Prophets. As much as the Prophet Sallallahu was exposed to tragedy, and if there was anyone that could numb himself, it would be the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the intensity of his qiyam, the intensity of his dua, the intensity of his relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allowed him that necessary outlet so that he could keep doing this in a way that was pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Allah is pleased. And the last thing I'll say in this regard, when someone says, the, you know, when someone says I feel empty, I feel numb, uh, I need to move on and things of that sort, I need to protect myself. You know, I was reading Lata'af al-Ma'arif by Al-Hafid ibn Rajab rahimahullah when he talks about how siyam provokes something, how fasting provokes something. And he says, لِيَذُوقُ الْجُوعِ so that he could taste hunger so that he could feel what it is like to be of the hungry. So he could actually empathize with al-ja'ir, okay? He could empathize with the one who's hungry. It's not just so that a person takes their own blessings and says, I understand my blessings, but the end result of that is that you're thinking about the ja'ir. You're thinking about the one who's actually starving. You're thinking about the one who's actually hungry. Not just, alhamdulillah, I feel good. I know now the blessings that I have. Alhamdulillah, I have these blessings. They don't have those blessings. How can I get them over to them? What do I do? How do I push myself? That has to drive you. But if you're, if you're finding at times that the emotion part diminishes a bit, you know, subhanAllah, that's going to happen. You're going to find yourself in a situation where it's going to be hard. You know, they, they talk about this idea of crying yourself out. You're going to dry out of tears at times. But when you dry out of tears, don't dry out of deeds and find that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this personal ibadah that allows for an outlet and that allows for an input as well. The output is definitely tears and brokenness. The input has to be sincerity and dedication.
And then you can channel yourself towards those things, inshallah ta'ala, constantly. So it's not about feeling empty. It's about being empty when it comes to your deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts, fill our souls with the Qur'an, allow us to be amongst those that recite the revelation, that make dua with the revelation, and that channel that revelation in our personal lives and towards our brothers and sisters. Allahumma ameen. Aqul qawri hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa yisa'al muslimin fastaghfiru inna huwa al-ghafur rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allah makhfir al-mu'mineen wa al-mu'minat wa al-muslimin wa al-muslimat al-ahyai minhum wa al-amwat inna ka sami'un qaribun wajibu da'wat. Allah makhfir lana wa rahamna wa a'fu anna wa la tu'adhibna. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam takhfir lana wa tarhamna. Lana kuunanna min al-khasirin. Allah makhfir lana wa rahamna wa a'fu anna wa la tu'adhibna. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam takhfir lana wa tarhamna. Lana kuunanna min al-khasirin. Allah makhfir lana wa rahamna wa a'fu anna wa la tu'adhibna. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam takhfir lana wa tarhamna. Lana kuunanna min al-khasirin. Allah وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم انصر إخوانا المستضعفين في فلسطين اللهم انصر إخوانا المستضعفين في غزة اللهم أصلح أحوال إخوانا المنكوبين في كل مكان اللهم عليك بالظالمين اللهم عليك بالظالمين اللهم عليك بالظالمين اللهم أهلك الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرجنا وإخواننا بينهم سالمين عباد الله أن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على النعماء يزيد لكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقيم الصلاة